the ripest tomato ever to come out of New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, unpack. Yeah. Uh, walk us through this thing, because it seems impossible that this even existed. Uh, the, the most successful movie of all time, within, by the end of the year it came out, spawned this. This, I know. Exactly. Is this hot? Are we local? What's happening? Oh. It's a small room, we could project. <laughs> the most amazing thing is that none of those people was raised by Bill Cosby. <laughs> I mean, it, it is actually, I mean, it aired Thanksgiving weekend in 1978, I think. Uh, but uh, it was actually, George Lucas had invented that holiday, which they were celebrating, which was called Life Day. Right. But you asked how it started. It started because, uh, you know, uh, back then, Star Wars kind of created the, the blockbuster uh, franchise after Jaws. Those were the first ones, I mean, the, the template for, for releasing something on 700,000 screens and having to make all the money in the first weekend and all that, that was, that was something that, that happened back then. And George, uh, Star Wars had been this incredible phenomenon that George had shot The Empire Strikes Back, which was the, the second one, or if you are in Star Wars lore, of course, that's the, the fifth one. <laughs> because if you look at them all, you know, the six movies, you have to turn to the, the, the first three at the beginning, the second three at the beginning. It's so fucking complicated. <laughs> chasing the neurons that around. It's like that. So uh, he was a little concerned that the Empire Strikes Back would not uh, open with the same force that Star Wars had. So he needed a little something to prime the pump because it was a year away from release. And in those days, there were lots and lots of variety specials. I mean, there's nothing. Uh, and, and especially around the holidays, there were lots. The only thing now is Michael Bublé is the only one I think that does one now. But there was a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, so he... Went to CPS and he, he sold them this idea. And he had, he told me later, wrote, he, he, he'd written uh, 10 ideas for uh, Star Wars stories. And he said, We're going to make six movies. And this was in 1977. He told me this. And he eventually did make the six after like a 30 year hiatus. And then he had a bunch of other stories. One he sold as a graphic novel, and one he sold as um, a novel, which is a graphic novel without the pictures. <laughs> Tell people <laughs> <laughs> and then one he sold his uh, I think his conscience, and then there was this one left. But one he, he held in the veins, which I gather is, is the new one. But he had this one story left, and he sold them this one story, and I got to write it. Unfortunately, it, uh, the lead characters were the Wookiees. <laughs> the Wookiees look like me, <laughs> and they speak no language known in this or any other universe. They <laughs> which is high on their own. <laughs> you have, they sound like fat people having orgasms. <laughs> Trust me, I know. <laughs> and so you had to write dialogue for these things. And he, he went into the network and he had this story laid out. And it was um, it was the Wookiees um, where the central characters Chewbacca, the big Wookiee, was uh, on the Millennium Falcon with. Um, uh, Han Solo and Princess Play, they were all on their way home. They were trying to get back to the uh, Wookiee planet so they could celebrate Life Day, which was a holiday George invented that he thought would take on. It was like Festivus. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he really thought that he, he really thought Life Day. Day, he thought he could start a movement and there would be Life Day would just celebrate life, not in the, the right wing pro life sense, but in the left wing life. So, <laughs> and that was when they were rushing home to get Chewbacca home to celebrate this thing, which had started as a Wookiee holiday and was now going throughout the galaxy. And um, so they uh, they made various stops on the way, and eventually they had to get home to the, 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 the Wookiee family, Chewbacca and Mrs. Chewbacca, who was kind of a California Wookiee, who fried long. <laughs> Grandpa, what he was a silver haired Wookiee. One of them was named Lumpy. I remember the Lumpy. Lumpy was the baby. The baby was Chewbacca. Exactly. 
And since they spoke no language, we had to keep bringing in guest stars to stand next to them. <laughs> <laughs> Eat them things. So Art Carney was the intergalactic Tupperware seller, who <laughs> was, was, was trying to sell, this is Chewbacca, you know, things. Say, well, how are you? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> so we all go, I'm Well, there's a big <laughs> so, uh, and everybody had a fantasy. This is how we got to get started. And George invented a helmet that they we put on the Wookiees heads, and they would they would channel into their inner fantasies. And so the, the little kid's fantasy was Cirque du Soleil, which was just starting out at the time. And uh, and Mrs. Chewbacca's fantasy was Julia Child. Uh, played by Harvey Corman. But <laughs> <laughs> as an alien with many arms. Yeah, we're gonna make big soup. First, let's all take a leap. <laughs> and, um, and and then the old man, the old Wookiee, uh, his fantasy was Cher, but um, she was not available. <laughs> she, I think had just gotten sick, and she was really not <laughs> Well, you know, we all had to get them uh, had mine for years. <laughs> so Diane Carroll, um, who uh, fits into the same dress, actually, <laughs> and Bob Mackey designed both the outfits. So Diane Carroll played uh, the, the old man's fantasy. So it really was the first interracial, interspecies <laughs> romance on network television. And Where's it my NAACP award? It aired in the South. It aired in the South. It aired for Ed Jefferson. Starship was on it. And who runs the bar? Uh, well, that's the thing. On the way home, uh, they're on, they have to get uh, Chewbacca home, and so they stop on the planet Tatooine to refuel. If you are a Star Wars geek, you know what happens on the planet Tatooine in the cantina. Where all the aliens gather and kill each other and drink and all that stuff. And uh, in our version, the cantina was run by a very strong matriarchal force, B. Arthur. <laughs> Who else is going to be the manager of a legend high of Scotty like his dad's <laughs> And she sings. And she sings. Well, she only did it because she wanted to sing. She was Maud at the time. Maud was very big, but uh, she, she'd come from Broadway. She lived on the roof in Maine. She wanted to go on TV and sing. And so her, her deal breaker was that she had to do a number. Mm -hmm. And she picked out a song. And it was, uh, it was a breath vile song. My breath vile. I said, you mean your vile breath? <laughs> and it was the Alabama song. And she made, oh, show me the way to the next Christy bar. And he sang all the way down here. <laughs> she sang in the basement. Her key was in the basement. <laughs> Painful men would cross their legs when they started. <laughs> <laughs> no one said, I'll be fired. I didn't say that. No one said that. And, and, and it was one of those songs where the splash of the wrist was over. It ends with it saying, I tell you I will die. I tell you I will up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she could not be talked out of it. And, and so we find we, we wound up shooting it. And uh, we wound up shooting the number. And of course, um, I, I have a, a long story that I don't want to go into, but um, we couldn't use the, the, uh, the footage finally after we'd done about 20 oh. takes of it. Uh, well, I can't tell you this. All right, I'll, I don't know if we have time. Oh, yeah. we do. We do. Now you, 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 you can sprinkle that bread well, on Well, she was surrounded by aliens, and, and we, had, we had aliens everywhere. And, uh, and the aliens were like the characters of Disney, and they had those huge heads. And um, uh, they would pass out, because we were shooting with warnings and we were alive. <laughs> and they, they would just like, she'd start singing, and one would do a face plant. <laughs> So we couldn't use any of this footage. And so finally we had to go back in closer to the air gate and shoot it again with a song that came in its Gustro, which was a, 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 a Grechtian kind of song, but a little bit more up tempo than the other. But the other story is, is so profane and full of dirty words, I really can't do it. Anymore. No, 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 no. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, so here are the aliens. I'll tell you about the aliens. Um, the, uh, George had used all the A-list aliens. In, 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 the, in the movie, in, in Star Wars, in the Empire Strikes Back, and he was kind of out of aliens, and he didn't want to tip any of the aliens from the new movie. 
So he had a warehouse full of aliens that hadn't made the cut. <laughs> <laughs> and he dragged those over, and they were like remainder aliens. They were like <laughs> aliens you'd get at the Outlet Mall. <laughs> <laughs> they had scotch tape, you know, they had the, the Elmer's glue wall, and they were just not good. And one of them we called Cuntface. <laughs> George has this uh, vagina thing. If you look at George Lucas, all the Star Wars, it's a leaf motif. There's a vagina in every one of those movies. I don't know what, I never got to talk to him about it, but it made me crazy. But in The Empire Strikes Back, there's a huge angry red vagina that swallows Carrie in the desert. <laughs> Top of the hut, another character I resemble vaguely, uh, was, uh, gets swallowed up by this angry vagina. Anyway, so uh, this particular alien was just with like a vagina head on a body. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was very, uh, the moment I saw it, I said, that stays in. <laughs> <laughs> I had a network sensor come clear, and she, she said, what's familiar? I said, okay. <laughs> Confess got into the thing, so now we're shooting it, and as we're shooting it, each time we shoot it, somebody else would be in. And every time one of them would be carried off, you know, I would go, Confess. It's <laughs> closer to me. Because you know, if you're an extra in the movie or TV, you want to stay in the picture, and you just get near the star. So every time, it was like, <laughs> so about about 17 takes, we're now down to 17 takes, and Cuntface is on her shoulder. <laughs> Two shot. And, and she's saying, I tell you, I will die. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, I will die. Grand gesture. Taped it, 
this was in the early days of, of like Betamax and three quarter inch. And, I mean, I, the copies I had of them were those ancient formulas. Were you over really? <laughs> you could, but you could hook up your TV and tape it. And then there are people who did that and they posted it on YouTube many years later. And a generation that had grown up watching Star Wars on tape on TV at home, who had no idea that this existed, suddenly saw this thing, and they were mortified. <laughs> oh, and George began getting desperate. I began getting desperate. <laughs> he began getting desperate. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was they were, you know, these people, these Star Wars fanatics were like, well, they're revving up again. You were ready for the series. The trailer for the new movie came out last week, and they're all ready. You know, ready like, what, a black Imperial Star Wars work? What the hell? <laughs> that may even go Cosmia, but they changed the whole quote. But uh, they, they were uh, really, they, they were actively like the craze of it, and, and that attracted media attention, which was exactly the opposite of what George wanted. And so now the George is, is you, you, you can't, if he mentions it, he'll walk away from it. He doesn't want to know about it. Okay, indulge me. Okay, this will not leave this room. How many people have a copy of that in their collection? Okay. Thank I thought it would be more. It, uh, it is the Brady Variety Hour of Science Fiction. <laughs> 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 okay. yes. 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 And the Holy Halloween favorite shows in. The Holy Halloween special. The Halloween special. And the Brady Bunch Variety Hour and Star Wars. And that way I don't have to mention Wayne Newton and SeaWorld. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Porter in Paris starring Tommy Stevens. Oh. Just so you want to hear sing Paul Porter. Yeah. Hot Rod, Hot! Nice woman. Is there a lot now that you've been mentioning these titles? Oh, there, uh, uh, Stephen Eady sing the Beatles. Hot <laughs> <laughs> Daddy. Eady, you know, he belted out Norwegian wood. <laughs>
chick's got something. I don't know what it is, but you know, she. It was, but that that was the whole kind of attitude. Like, I don't know about you guys, but it looks like fun. So it's, it's I was, well, and the thing I love though is that in, in those days, so far, you see, you know, it's, it's Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford can be Arthur and Arthur Conan. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, when you said talk to him, I, I flashed the you know, on. Gene Simmons of Kiss sitting next to Tony Beals on my cover. Yeah. Yeah. And that I was like, well, we need more of that. You know, it's right. such strange parents. I know. Well, it's like a battle of network stars. You can't talk people into doing that stuff anymore. Like, no. I used to write circus in the star. Oh, wow. Um, which, you know, we, I mean, partially Peter killed it because oh, they just didn't want to, you know, see animals doing, doing acts that or you unleashed some starlet on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> You know, lines with a, a no sounding perfect, sounding perfect in a big cat act. <laughs> <laughs> and these cats looked at her and went, This must be strange. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I had a good time doing the show. And uh, it, it's something, you know, partially it's like, it's, it's, it was, we're so fragmented now in the 500 channel universe and all that, and, and with uh, the internet, it makes it even more fragmented. But those things were like national event kind of things. Right. That everybody bought into it, but they were they were so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but, they were, but they were like it was the it was the national pastime, and now we can indulge ourselves in so many kind of things that it's hard to get something. And without that, every all that stuff looks really ridiculous. I mean, when it's you know, Dancing with the Stars is the closest thing now. Which sure. you'll, you'll actually you know tune in to watch Paul McCartney's One Leg White. <laughs> Tommy Chong. <laughs> Watch Tommy Chong dance. I mean, the Tommy Chong can walk across the room. It's astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> but for the last 12 weeks on, on a show about dancing, <laughs> it gives me hope. Maybe I can. Well, for one or two, Bruce, nobody remembers anything else that aired on Thanksgiving weekend of 1978. And people are still watching, and the Star Wars Hall is going to and we'll do so until, you know. Time and we're until, until Carrie learns the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> they all came for one day. I think they, they all actually shot. Oh, he got the cast to come for one day, and everybody was totally stunned. And they were kind of. And you can see they're just. Just Harris and the Black Sea. Just supposed to say Carrie was snorting the sweet load. <laughs>